Diana Loy graced the silver screen for over five decades as a leading lady. She presented feminine charm and subtlety on a level other actresses could only dream of. With four marriages under her belt and a very progressive mother, Myrna acted opposite men who defined masculinity in various ways. But with Montgomery Clift, she would find a more modern actor, with progressive views she also espoused. Prior, there was William Powell from the Thin Man series, elegant, debonair, and chivalrous. You can learn more about William Powell on this channel. There was Leslie Howard from the Animal Kingdom, the Bohemian Rebel Son. There was Frederick March in The Best Years of Our Lives, a tired war veteran come home. And there was Montgomery Clift, the man who would define American masculinity on screen as bewildered, overwhelmed, and self-destructive. Montgomery Clift, born in 1920 when Myrna Loy was 15, had been working for Dor Sherry at MGM at the time of the actor's devastating 1956 car accident, which disfigured his face, cost him several teeth and left him chronically afflicted with back pain. After leaving a party organized by co-star Elizabeth Taylor in May 1956, Clift raced along a steep road before crashing. Clift was driving a Chevrolet Bel Air sedan when the accident occurred. The crash caused severe damage to his face, and witnesses noted in a 2018 interview that they thought Clift was dead when they saw the scene. Clift owed his life to his close friend Taylor, who immediately went to help him when she learned of the incident. According to witness McCarthy, Cliff told Taylor in a rather unregistered voice that his two front teeth were in his throat, suffocating him. He pleaded with her to get them out, and gently, she managed to relieve him of the teeth. Cliff's Rain Tree Country, co-star Taylor remained with him at the accident scene and cradled his badly injured head till an ambulance arrived. She did not show the same concern for Marilyn Monroe, however and studios moving resources to Elizabeth Taylor instead of Monroe has been cited as one of the reasons Monroe took to more and more pills, he would shake with pain. Already a heavy drinker and pill popper when he crashed his car into a telephone pole in 1956, he subsequently became so dependent on alcohol, speed and painkillers that he could only work in the morning. By lunchtime he would be too high to work. In Miss Lonely Hearts 1958, Lloyd jumped at the chance to work on this drama. Her romance with Bleeding Heart journalist character Adam was toned down. The result is a lovely film without the novel's heart-wrenching. For example, in the novel, the journalist is shot dead. Clift mocked the happy ending of the movie as a travesty, telling others he could find no trace of author Nathaniel West in it. Where's the corruption? The misery? Hysteria has been replaced by blandness. The hysteria of the original character likely attracted Clift as his look is consistently hysteric, mad. Clift had sex with both men and women and had a gift for friendship with women. A good listener, he could be wonderfully caring and supportive. Elizabeth Taylor, with whom he co-starred in two more movies after their memorable teaming in A Place in the Sun, headed the list. Intimate friends and perhaps lovers too, Taylor and Clift even looked alike. Clift called Taylor his true twin, his other half. Most of his other close female friends were older women who mothered him. Sorka Viertel, the blacklisted former writer of screenplays for Garbo, was one. The tobacco heiress, fellow drinker drug addict and one-time torch singer Libby Holman was another, and the comic actress Nancy Walker who visited Clift in California while Lonely Hearts was in production was a third. Myrna Loy would join this select circle. Clift's astute biographer Patricia Bosworth doesn't name her informant. But she quotes someone the set of Lonely Hearts who describes Myrna's electric response to Clift when they first met, there were sparks. He had this kind of cosmic thing. They began to spend lots of time together. She was not that much older than him, and was envied by other actresses including Joan Crawford for her natural aging. Loey's personal assistant and friend Leone Rosson reported in her diary entries, August 23, 1958 ml meaning Myrna Loy first dinner date with Monty. August 25th Miss Lowy left with Monty from studio for dinner. August 27th ML Monty. End of picture. August ML Lunch Monty. I went to rushes with ML and Monty. August 29th ML Monty Bel Air Hotel. In early September, Clift's driver drove them to La Jolla where they spent a few days. Leone with them, but stayed in another hotel. Her September 7th diary reads picked ML and Monty up at 730 and we went to LA. It isn't clear if they were sharing a room. It's impossible to know at this time if they became lovers. Maybe a maid or hotelier from the La Jolla scene may remember. 
Alcohol impairs sexual performance and Clift was drinking heavily at the time, so it may be unlikely. Jack Larson said he didn't know whether the relationship was sexual, but Clift's confidant Sorka Vital thought it was. Larson also said Clift was a very physical, affectionate man who liked to touch those he loved. He adored Myrna, and she in turn was wonderful to Monty, very loving. One has to remember Myrna was made sterile by an abortion before her first marriage and had always wanted children. You can learn more about this in the Myrna Lowy video on the channel. So perhaps she was playing a maternal role to Clift. In her autobiography, Myrna dismisses any such notion and denies the rumors, reported in newspapers of the day and reported in Patricia Bosworth's biography of Clift, that she was deeply in love with him and wanted to marry him. According to Myrna, Monty's sexual drive tormented him. She wrote, he could never quite settle for homosexuality. He wanted men but loved women. She implies he was too troubled to take on any committed relationship, but there's no question that she cared deeply for him, and may have been sexually attracted to him as well. Myrna depicts herself not as a captive of a desire, but as a potential rescuer for a gifted lost man. Intelligent, well-read and perceptive, Clift had been a professional actor since boyhood and possessed a director's sense of what would work in a scene. He coached Myrna and helped edit down a scene in which she and Robert Ryan go at each other in Lonely Hearts. Myrna offered one of her most concentrated and affecting performances on the screen and won the enduring affecting, an admiration of Robert Ryan. Monty wanted to work with Myrna again, perhaps in the theater which she turned to as she got older. He spoke of a production of Hamlet in which he would play the tormented prince, Peter Finch would be Claudius and Myrna would be Queen Gertrude, Hamlet's mother. He envisioned a dramatization of Colette's Sherry featuring Myrna as the aging courtesan. He was too bent on self-destruction to realize either project. Ten years after the car accident and six years after Lonely Hearts he would die in his Manhattan at age 45 of a heart attack. During the filming of the 1958 Lonely Hearts, Cliff drank so much at night and took so many pills he would pass out. You'd have to put him to bed, Jack Larson remembers. Myrna tried to get him to stop drinking. In his presence she wouldn't drink at all and stick to Coca-Cola. Cliff darkened the windows of his room so he wouldn't have to look at himself. On sedatives and painkillers he would hallucinate, talking to Chimraz. Larson would run lines with him and find Cliff's copy of the script, a jumble of pages, not consecutive. When they were both back in New York, Cliff and Myrna continued to see each other for a while, attending the theater together, afterward going out to eat and in his case, drink. Often Cliff would have to be literally carried out of the restaurant or bar. Or they'd meet at parties hosted by Cliff or by the actor photographer Roddy McDowell, a new friend Myrna had met through Cliff. When Cliff summoned her, she would drop everything to be with him. Leone Rosson's diary records a night that she scheduled jointly to go over Myrna's financial records. Monty called so our work night was cancelled, she wrote. But toward the end of his life in 1966, she stopped seeing him. Myrna came to the forlorn conclusion that he was beyond help and that watching him destroy himself was more than she could bear. 